we bring ourselves and our concerns in our hearts into this time of worshipping God. As we gather here once again on a Sunday, having made the journey from whatever your week has brought to you, whether it was carefree and lovely, or careworn and challenging. All of life is found here because all of life is in us and with us. In our worship today, we shall be using the resources made available by Eco Congregation and Creation Time as we worship together on this Climate Sunday.
Say to those who are fearful of heart, Be strong. Do not fear. He is your God. He will come with vengeance, terrible recompense. He will come and save you. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy, for waters shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert, the burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs, springs of water. Let us come before God now in prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, you created us. You made this world and you called your creation good. Yes, even we are included in your judgment of goodness. Let us rest in that for a moment. Consider how its blessing falls upon you. Creator God, we have been blessed indeed by you, gifting to us a world in fullness of life, of oceans deep and mountains high. Every living creature offering their praise and thanksgiving as they would take their place in your creative will. Loving God, we remember that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Yet often we forget that you are our loving parent who continues to bless your world. Jesus, you told us that you are in heaven. Yet we fail to live in awe of you. We take you for granted and we don't see the awesome beauty of the world you have made. We pray, hallowed be your name. We confess that our reverence for you does not always lead us to care reverently for your earth, sky and sea. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We confess that we often put our own interests first, exploiting your creation and living for our own convenience and self-interest. We pray, give us today our daily bread. We confess that we consume more than our share of the world's resources. While billions go hungry every day and your whole creation suffers. We pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
we confess that we see these words only in spiritual terms while the Bible is filled with teachings about economic justice and creation care. We pray, save us from the time of trial. Help us to resist the temptations of spending more, using more, acquiring more, and wasting more. We pray, deliver us from evil. Free us from greed and self-centeredness that separate us from you and others. We pray for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Help us to know that in caring for your wonderful world, we are working for your kingdom, being good stewards of your creative power and giving you glory. We pray Amen. Amen that means let it be so. And then we know we can be faithful disciples by your grace. Amen. Our reading taken from the lectionary comes from James's letter to the early church. It's a strongly worded letter urging the early church and now us as his readers today to consider how we treat the whole of creation and all the creatures of our God and King. We read from the second chapter of James, beginning at verse 1. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favouritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, oh, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you fulfill the royal law according to scripture. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. 
But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if we say you have faith but do not put it into action, can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, when it's not put into action, is dead. Amen. As we let James's words settle, many questions may come to our spirits. Who benefits most from our world structures? The rich and privileged in the world are most likely the ones whose daily footprint makes the most impact. Are they really the greatest? Do we make demands of the poor first of all when the rich could lead the way to lower carbon emission and reduce wasteful living. How can any Christian mission, mission with any integrity at all disregard, evade or hide from our environmental responsibility? What does it mean then in a global sense to honour the poor as James demands. As we sit with that question, we realise that throughout his ministry and dealings with others, Jesus was also presented with just such questions himself. We now read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, beginning at chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. Then Jesus left and went away to the territory near the city of Tyre. He went into a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, but he could not stay hidden. A woman whose daughter had an evil spirit in her heard about Jesus and came to him at once and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile, born in the region of Phoenicia and Syria. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter but Jesus answered, let us first feed the children. It isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. So she answered, even the dogs under the table eat the children's leftovers. So Jesus said to her, because of that answer, go back home where you will find that the demon has gone out of your daughter. She went home and found her child lying in the bed. The demon had gone out of her. Jesus then left the neighbourhood of Tyre and went on through Sidon to the Lake Galilee, 
going by way of the territory of the ten towns. Some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. So Jesus took him off alone, away from the crowd, put his fingers in the man's ears, spat and touched the man's tongue. Then Jesus looked up to heaven, gave a great groan and said to the man, Ephapha, which means open up. At once the man was able to hear, his speech impediment was removed and he began to talk without any trouble. Then Jesus ordered the people not to speak of it to anyone, but the more he ordered them not to, the more they told it. The girls who heard were completely amazed. How well he does everything, they exclaimed. He even causes the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to you. What a way to launch out into a season where the quality of our faith is immediately and nakedly on show in the inconsistency, or shall we say unconformity, of our behaviour when we're confronted by inequalities at home in human cultures. But then, as Jesus also said, there is nothing hidden that will not come to light. So worship is no place to hide. Holy ground is where you bring the difficult things. And for geologists, ground does not come much holier than where we are today. Our location is Sikha Point, where the great age of the earth began to be dizzyingly apparent in James Hutton's unconformity. Here, rock from the ancient world comes face to face with other rock which is further in time from the first than we are from the dinosaurs. Sikha Point may be the most important geological site in the world, but only because here some human beings overcame prejudice to take note of what was staring them in the face. And I hope to start with a perfectly valid way to approach this standoff between Jesus and the foreign woman would be to allocate some roles. So Jesus, son of man, aka the heir of humanity, inherits the mantle of our responsibility for healing and therefore our guilt for the dysfunctional relationship of the global north with the earth and globally with the human victims or perhaps targets of injustice. The foreign woman then takes the role of the earth. She exhibits the lack of bitterness that's characteristic of nature's capacity for something like goodwill when given the chance to thrive, to heal, to rewild. Like her, the earth answers back. It gives us pause for thought in all our best intentions, to honour those who stand to bring most to the community. Then with James we will recognise that it is to the earth and to the oppressed that that honour is due, for the good of all, rather than the concessionary charity of the celebrity for public relations advantage. And then there's also the deeply traditional bonus of witnessing what it might look like for Jesus to be carrying in himself the sin of humanity, taking it on, assuming it, in order to wrestle with our cherished abusive and preferential attitudes, our favoritism, our cronyism, our class exclusivism, old-style nationalism and sexism. All of these demons, which without fail afflict the earth, 
because they afflict people. People whose impact the planet lacks the luxury of ignoring. And just as honoring the rich and wealthy risks are becoming their victim, so there is no hiding place sitting on the fence. To be cast out, evicted, demons have to be named, called out, owned up to. Even and especially from the position of the powerless, the Bible's first audience. We don't do that by denying, out of desperation to avoid offence, that demons of prejudice, complacency and denial are part of our own life, especially in the global north. Because we are free neither of prejudice nor environmental impact. But when these things are denied, evaded or minimised, they do the most harm. So do we end up as judges with evil thoughts rather than responsible healers? colluding with twisted fairness, which ignores the stacked injustice of the outset, rather than aiming at justice in the outcome. Value your neighbour as much as you value yourself. That is a Bible teaching which is alien to international dealings amongst nation-states. We have a world-beating system. We prefer world-beating to world-healing. The continual need to beat the world is a sign of weakness. Because we continue to insist that we made the right decision at the right time and that plans are on track, even when they patently are not. Prejudice, of course, is prejudice, prejudging. It's lazily shirking that God-given responsibility of risk and decisions that are for us to make. Judgments that we shirk at our peril. James offers the bluntest ultimatum in the New Testament epistles, that faith not put into action is dead. And that prejudice, those oven ready attitudes which claim authority, irrespective of evidence, those have no place in Christian faith. It's even more shocking that this letter is written so close in time to the community's saving experience of Christ's resurrection. And it's written to a Christian community which is already exhibiting a Dysfunctional toxicity, which, with a human population approaching 8 billion, leeches into the lifeblood of the planet. Reading this shock jock James, faith has no laurels to rest on, but it's shown in ongoing, urgent and active contribution to the health of whatever world you encounter. Everyone needs the gospel every day. It's a sustaining power, not a rubber stamp. This comes together here with one of the most controversial of all the stories of Jesus in a time when our awareness of race and privilege is heightened to fever pitch. In the story, Jesus has concentrated his efforts on his own people, only to be confronted by the equally compelling needs of others. It sounds scarily like governments who see foreign aid as a waste rather than an investment in the home that we all share. And it's precisely when we hear the pain of the planet and wish it were not so, that we also become afraid that our own prejudice might be showing that we condemn others rather than attend to what needs to change in us as well as in them. This year the G7 met without the least developed countries and the small island developing states. Pray God that these parties can come together in the court of COP in Glasgow in November. If there are answers, these will at worst involve, at best come from, the poor and the marginalised, including the earth. Would it be such a strange thing to impute honour to the poor? Perhaps in listening respectfully to the witness of the small island states at COP this November. Because that is the blessing which is enjoyed, you might say, by the poor and oppressed. The blessing that those oppressed by proxy enjoy as freak weather takes its toll. The knowledge and the insights, first of all, for what's heading for everyone else, without far-reaching change at every level. Their voice should be honoured and respected above those of the wealthy who imagine themselves secure. Though perhaps we've seen this year in environmental disasters afflicting the global north, the downside of favouritism. Favour the rich and secure ahead of the prophetic word of the suffering and the mantle and perhaps the fate of judges with evil thoughts awaits. It's strangely under the guise of graciousness that we're ready to exempt broken people from pointing to healing, as if those who are hurting have no competence to contribute. Jesus does the opposite. Jesus includes the disadvantaged, the marginalised, the victims of prejudice. He doesn't impose cure without consultation. 
And so no one is exempt, neither the unjust nor the just. If there is a demon at large, both in the story for Mark and in our churches, it's this demon of internalized oppression. The illusion that the help that we can give ourselves is of no value, or that, or that prayer is of no value. Now, as our friend the evil judge might say, No respectable person is ever a racist. Not the slightest bit. And no one's so stupid as to be a climate denier. Yet custom on autopilot bridles our thinking, vaccinating us against real and urgent change. So we see repentance as a threat rather than liberation. We see action as immoderate. We see hesitation and prejudice as wisdom. Or sometimes, far worse, we see these as faith. But what about when we hear Jesus apparently saying that helping desperate people or like maybe rescuing climate refugees is like feeding dogs with the food earmarked for children? Because we know Jesus' agenda, like that of most who first hear it, was my own people first. Ouch! Cliff edge. Or do we reach for those sad old Jesus didn't really mean that arguments? For some, the easiest way out of the difficult story of Jesus and the foreign woman is to stick on the top layer. To protect themselves by smearing Jesus with historical prejudice. For it is as a pious Jewish healer with a reputation for results that Jesus is approached by this desperate foreign mother. Some like to say that she had great faith in God, but all we hear of is her groveling. She fell at his feet on behalf of her troubled daughter. Bible commentaries never tire of pointing out the cultural incongruousness of a lone woman aggravated by being, as it were, an unclean alien. And yet these historical geographical particularities, Galilean man, Syrophoenician woman, that does not muzzle the contemporary bite of this tale which is so craftily included as good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Some see it this way. Jesus embodying the respectable prejudice of his people embodies in himself our need to learn and change, being taught by this woman who's qualified by her many disadvantages. She's one of the few in the New Testament who answer Jesus back and get away with it. And he commends her and not only her daughter, but the visible aspect of Jesus' own outlook is seen to be made whole. That's a solid enough layer for some, though it's not the only rock to build on. And for those who are more desperate to protect Jesus than get to know him, it will be a stumbling block. Likewise, the small scope of the story. Despite the healing, surrounding society continues apparently unchanged, so please bear in mind, next time someone questions the point of your small environmental action, Although the world is not globally sorted out, there's a whole lot of healing going on. In the story, it's not only of the woman's child, but also of herself. Healing with Jesus is no individual matter. It has ripples. Jesus' healings are never either passive or imposed without consent. They come about through relationship with the person or bubble or community concerned. Can we meet the earth in that way? We yearn to know what we live within, the everlasting life of God. Perhaps it isn't so much a once in a lifetime discovery. A journey of discovering in each new day that even before we rise from our slumber, God has gone before us.
we prepare to come before God, take a moment just to settle yourself. Let us pray. Settle yourself where you are. Make sure you are sitting in a comfortable position. Have your eyes closed if it helps and pay attention to the words or phrases that you hear. What is stirring in your imagination? What are you feeling in response? My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favouritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the other who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to scripture. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of them says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill. And yet you do not supply their bodily needs. What good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Be still. My brothers and sisters, and know that God is with you. Invite God to be present in your attention today. Allow your imagination to place yourself in the story that James told. Where are you in it? What can you see? What can you smell? What else can you hear? Who are you in the story? Are you James speaking? Perhaps you are listening. Or the speaking is going on in the background. What are you doing as you hear? Who is with you? Are you in a group of strangers or with friends? Be fully present in the scene. 
James doesn't hold back in his warning of words over action. Can faith save you? Judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. How does that make you feel? Do you feel any emotion, guilt or discomfort, curiosity or encouragement? Can you remember any times you have treated people differently because of their status or appearance? For what they have or who they are? What about the rest of creation? Have there been times when you have said the right things about care for creation but failed to follow through in actions? Invite God to be with you in your feelings, both positive and negative. Notice the times when you put faith into action. Acknowledge the times you have noticed but failed to. Sit with both of these. Thanking God for the positive memories and asking forgiveness for the moments missed. Remember Jesus's, James's words to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Ask God to help you notice who your neighbors are today. Is it only those who live close by? Are your neighbours further afield too? Who are our neighbours globally and how do you connect with them today in these difficult days? How do you love and act for those most affected by climate emergency, COVID and warmongering. How might God help us recognise all peoples and all creation as our neighbour? Take a moment. Notice how you're feeling. Are you drained or filled with energy? Do you feel challenged or encouraged? We ask you, God, to be with us in all we feel each day. Help us to notice where we can take action, knowing you are giving us the gifts and the skills we need for this work you call us to. Help us to care for our neighbours close at hand and further afield. Today, we especially pray for Murali and Kasturi and for Murali's father, mother and brother who are ill in India. We give thanks that there is improvement. 
and some good news to share today. Continue to keep them all in God's peace and may God's healing be theirs, an eternal comfort in present distress. We give thanks for family and friends who have been our faithful companions throughout our days and who are now at rest with you, God. And we pray for those among us who now grieve a loved one's parting. Speak to our unresolved griefs and hopes, Lord, for ourselves and all our neighbours and bring healing in the conversation. Have mercy on us, O God, in heavenly love abiding, no change our hearts shall fear, and safe is such confiding, for God is round about us, and we shall not be dismayed. In Jesus' grace and in his love's presence, we pray.
and the next, now and evermore. Amen. Thank you.